When you want to fly someplace exciting, think of TWA. We fly to New York, to Washington, to Chicago, and to St. Louis. And we're the only airline that can also fly you to Honolulu and on to the Orient for a business trip or a vacation to remember, call your travel agent or TWA. We're the only airline that can take you around the U.S. and around the world. You want to know about my Honda? Well, it's really fantastic in traffic, uphills, downhills, desert driving. The movability of it. It's a lot roomier inside than I thought. Sure is a great family car. I haven't had any access. If you've forgotten how much fun owning a car can be, talk to somebody who owns a Honda Civic. Mucho, mucho room in it. They seem to be getting more miles of smiles than just about anybody. I don't know what to say. <laughs> In the news tonight, the Greyhound buses are rolling again, just in time for the holidays. I'm Don Harris. We'll have details on the KNBC News Service at 11. This is KNBC Los Angeles, Channel 4. We begin this NBC News white paper with an assumption. We assume you know there is a food crisis in the world, that millions of people could die of starvation this coming year. That's why representatives of 130 countries met here in the Palazzo dei Congressi in Rome. They were delegates to the first World Food Conference conducted by the United Nations. The delegates were serious and well-meaning. It has been estimated that over 200 million children in the developing world are victims of malnutrition. Actual starvation is the ultimate manifestation of a chronic and widespread food shortage. I believe very strongly that in the planning of crop production and the allocation of supplies over the next 10 years or so, food aid should be regarded as a primary necessity. However laudable the intentions, the conference was not what could be called a success. But the seriousness of it all was obvious when the delegates came here, world food reserves were dangerously low, down to 27 days. And the United States, the world's greatest food producer, proposed a worldwide food reserve system. We therefore propose that this conference organize a reserves coordinating group to negotiate a detailed agreement on an international system of nationally held grain reserves at the earliest possible time. But there was no concrete agreement on the proposal, and delay is dangerous. More people will starve next year than this, and each year thereafter, for as far as we can see. The reason is simple, and the food production capacity of this planet is limited, but the people production capacity is unlimited, and the food that is produced is not distributed efficiently where it is most needed. Just too many people and too little food. So a great many of the people must die horribly. 400 million people are already suffering from malnutrition. That is 10% of the world population. And in the hour that this program will be on the air, 13,000 people will be born. Eventually, half of them will die. Because they did not get enough to eat. reasons to care other than compassion. Hungry people are dangerous people. In this same hour, we will try to answer some questions. Why are these people dying? Why should Americans care what is happening to them and to the world they leave?
who shall feed this world. You say you dreamt your house caught fire and a fireman stepped on your chihuahua and drowned your geranium and your wife drove through a chicken truck and you had the wrong coverage so your insurance company won't pay. Is that what's troubling you, Bunky? Well, stand up and take a walk in the sun straight to your independent insurance agent. He's an expert on trouble. Independent of any one company, he works to find the best policies for you. Look him up in the yellow pages. If he can't help you, nobody can. We're at the Great Fried Fish Race. In lane one, shortening. Two, cooking oil. Four, the leading pan coating. And in lane three, new cooking ease. It even looks different. Fry those fish. Done, tilt the griddle. The fish fried in new cooking ease didn't stick. It's delicious, not greasy, not dry. Cooking ease is a whole new way to cook. For delicious fried and baked foods with no sticking, new cooking ease. Blooming in minutes into a photograph as real as life itself. It makes you eager to grab hold of the world. Almost effortlessly, the SX-70 slips through life. Searching out, recording. Press the button. There it is. It's as simple as that. Polaroid's SX-70, land camera. When Grandfather made this chair, he didn't get the legs quite even. That nick on the back there is Uncle Joe throwing his choo-choo at your mother. The cigarette burn on the arm is the night you were born. And now that you're going to move it across the country, wouldn't you like to know that the people who move it know how you feel about it? Allied Band Lines. We move families, not just furniture. There are some things human beings just can't do without. Air, water, sleep, and food. But there is not enough food, and there are too many people. Some nations are multiplying themselves to death. One of them is India. It is typical of the developing nations of the world. Their cities are overcrowded. Their people are mostly hungry and malnourished. In the farming areas of these nations, like rural India, life is only slightly less bad. This is the village of Kali Pashim. It is centuries old. This farmer is Anganu Parshad. I have lived in this village of my ancestors since my birth and will remain till I die. It is the only place I know. Anganu, his wife, seven children, his mother and daughter-in-law live in one half of a house without electricity or running water. Anganu Parshad is 50 years old, or maybe 52 or 55. He is old. Life expectancy here is 53 years. <laughs> If he had a birth certificate, he couldn't read it. Like his ancestors, he is illiterate. Illiteracy, however, is not his problem. Survival is his problem. Anganu Parshad has $900 in assets. That half house, a bullock cart, two water buffalo, and one and one-third acres of tired land. 
in a good year, his income is $380. He grows rice here, and after he harvests it, he grows wheat in the same poor soil. We have to plant a wheat crop as quickly as possible. I realize that this also makes my yield lower. But I have no choice if my family is to eat. Well, Anganu Parshad scratches an existence and worships the god of large families, he has a counterpart in the United States who is utterly unlike him, but an equal part of the crisis. His name is Arlo Running, and he too is a careful, devoted farmer, but his land is some of the richest in the world. He grows wheat in North Dakota. 3,000 acres of it, outside the town of Harvey. Like Anganu Parshad, he lives, as his father did, in the same place with the same soil and air. But he is rich, and so is his country. Running is 33 years old. His wife, Arlene, is 31. They have two children. They planned it that way. Arlo would like his sons to go to college, and he'd like to have them become farmers. Right there. See it? If there's, if there's one thing that we could, we could, I could hand on to my, my children as a legacy would, would always be the, the freedom to walk through a field of, of waste high green. Uh, looking out over it as something that they had grown, that they, that was theirs, and that they, they could always realize the same satisfaction that that I do uh, when I look at it, and get the same feeling of love for the land, respect for the land. Angamu <laughs> Parshad shares his survival. All his children and relatives help. It was God's blessing. I could not do anything without them. These children help me work in the fields. They are my right hand. My children will also serve me in my old age when I can no longer work at all. The Parshad family is large as a matter of religious principle. They worship the Hindu god Shiva, the deity of love. The god is represented to them by a phallic symbol, and limiting the size of his family would be as sacrilegious to Anganu Parshad as destroying the fertility of the earth. The Parshad family is remarkable in that only one of the children has died. In India, one in four dies before the age of five. Like most people in the world, they are undernourished and susceptible to disease. Anganu Parshad, his mother, and one of his sons have malaria. But sick and weak and hungry, they must continue to work. No retirement, no social security. The overpopulation problem troubles the government of India. Family planners have campaigned in Kali Pashim, but they have failed here, as they have almost everywhere. The population of India has almost doubled in 20 years, from 366 million to 589 million. 40,000 new Indian babies every day. This rate is killing.
deers eat better and more regularly than the Parshans. It takes eight pounds of grain to make a pound of beef. And some of the richest countries can't grow enough grain to support their high protein meat habits. They depend on the United States for grain to feed their livestock. Meat products are high in protein, and protein is necessary to good health. In that way, wealth and health become the same thing. An American field of waist-high grain, lush and desirable, is a symbol of international affluence. KWT 401, are we doing reading? Base is mobile one, go ahead. Dinner's ready now if you're at a point where you can leave. Okay. But affluent countries make extravagant use of basic foods. They grow the best, but they eat the worst in terms of the food crisis. Arla Running lives comfortably and eats well. His family of four consumes five times the food the 11 Parshad people eat. Despite food shortages, India and most developing countries overpopulate. They believe in that. People in affluent countries have fewer children, but eat well. They believe that is their privilege. Overpopulation and overconsumption are twin factors of the crisis. As people like Angamu Parshad crowd the world and people like Arlie Running eat too well, the men themselves are caught in the crisis. Angamu Parshad must grow enough to feed his family and perhaps some of his countrymen. Arlie Running must grow enough to feed his country and an enormous part of the world. Last year, we asked which American car company backs its cars best, Ford, Chrysler, General Motors, or AMC, the only car company with a buyer protection plan. That's the plan that promises to fix or replace all these things except tires if they wear out under normal use and service during the first 12 months or 12,000 miles. And it's free. For 1975, American Motors backs you even better, announcing the double buyer protection plan. The same identical plan you get the first year free, you can now get the second year or second 12,000 miles for just $99 list. You double the length of your coverage to two years or 24,000 miles. And that includes a free loaner car for most dealers if the repairs take overnight, plus trip interruption protection. The double buyer protection plan from American Motors Corporation. Now when a year runs out, we don't. The double buyer protection plan at your AMC dealer, the economy expert. Sometimes my day starts at 8 in the morning and runs till 10 at night. Well, I can't let a headache interfere with that. I take Anison. It really comes through for me and without any upset. While all three leading pain relievers reach an effective level in your bloodstream in minutes, in the final analysis, only one of them hits and holds the highest level. Anison. This difference is the extra pain reliever Anison provides when you have a headache. For me, Anison is the one that works. Anison for a higher level of pain reliever. Would you dare dress like this to clean a dirty carpet? Now you can. Here's amazing Woolite Spray and Vacuum Rug Cleaner. Safely cleans carpets without scrubbing. Watch me clean half this filthy carpet. Vacuum Spray Woolite's Dirt Lifting Foam. Without scrubbing, it lifts out dirt. Just vacuum in. What a difference. Bright and clean and I didn't scrub. Woolite Spray and Vacuum. Recommended by Mohawk Carpets. Safely cleans carpets without scrubbing. In the spring of 1974, Arlie Running began his annual effort to help feed the world. He was understandably optimistic. For the first time in 20 years, the American government allowed farmers to cultivate all of their land. Every square inch of Arlie Running's 3,000 acres was sown with high-yielding wheat. Hopes were high and needs were great. 
World Food Reserves were at a dangerously low level. And the American surplus of grain had been depleted by the huge Soviet wheat deal in 1972 and by the growing scarcities of food last year throughout the world. The anticipated bumper crop of 1974 was a necessity. Anything less would be a disaster for all the countries that hunger for American grain. There would be strong competition for this American crop, expected to be huge. Americans have been called the Arabs of food. This is where the resources are. The needs are elsewhere. Like the Arabs with oil, Americans can send food where they want to, for reasons of their own. Yet growing food is not as easy as pumping oil. Agriculture experts could not be miracle workers. They could not control the weather. And the weather controls the future. We were anticipating a big crop again this fall and we were seeing this spring. As it turned out, we had the latest spring on record probably the wettest one we've ever encountered. So our, our harvest is getting bogged down. We're hitting the exact opposite we had last year. There, there's nothing sure about farming. Uh, you don't turn a switch and turn on the rain. You don't uh, turn a, a thermostat and, and turn down the temperature or turn it up. Uh, it's, it's one of the gambles and it's, it's a very risky business and it, it's uh, at all times like playing poker for large stakes, you have a lot invested and no guarantee of turning up the right card. All through the American Midwest in 1974, there was trouble. Drought burned the corn in Iowa and Nebraska. Soybean plants shriveled in Illinois and Indiana. Dakota wheat shrank. Early running never passes a day at harvest time without thinking about the weather. His wheat is ripe and ready. He needs hot sun, two days of it. But even as his machines worked the field, the wet clouds balked him. He had to halt his operation and wait. Oh, you're raining out again, huh? Yeah. How's that field look over there? It's pretty good, but this rain, you don't want to cut anymore, I don't think. Yeah, it's clouding up in the west. So listen to the forecast, and, and when she saw when she's going to clear up, you can figure on what we get cut cutting now. We got to cut. Right. Yeah. So. Okay. Yeah, we'll let you know when you. Yeah, I'll let you know. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Our production is probably down 50% or more. Uh, we will have enough, we hope, to make expenses, but. Uh, what we're primarily concerned with is quality, and, and we will have a quality grain, although the bushels per acre are going down considerably. That was bad news for the millions of neighbors of Anganu Parshad, and he had his problems too. Monsoon rains, sent by Shiva, the deity of fertility, were light and short. When they're good, the monsoons assure grain enough to feed almost all of India. When they are sparse, the monsoons guarantee hunger. There's an irrigation canal near Anganu Parshad's rice paddy. But the trickle of water was barely enough. At his wheat field, a mile away, there is no irrigation. To save the fields in this year of little rain, Anganu Parshad rented a neighborhood well for an hour a day. For many weeks, he spent 40 cents an hour to draw the water to his crop. Anganu Parshad's rice was one of the so-called miracle strains developed in the 1960s. 
India hoped these seeds would make her self-sufficient. Now, just to stand still, just to hold her own, India needs to increase its food grain production by about two and a half million tons per year. Now, that, that's a real challenge. That's a very big demand for increasing agricultural production, where all the increase has to come through, through increased yields. But the miracle strains of rice need the miracle of good weather, and they need fertilizer. In 1974, there was not enough good weather and not enough fertilizer. What there was cost too much because of another international crisis. The fertilizer they import has increased in cost because of the increase in oil. Now, this has been a devastating blow to India. The oil price increase ruined a generation of hopes for at at Indian economic progress, at least as far as I can tell. This country will be poor for another generation because of those price increases. I did put some fertilizers in my field. I managed to get one bag of 110 pounds with great difficulty, which covered only one half acre. If I had more, my yield would have been much greater. Our running had a different problem, but one just as serious. There was no cheap fuel, no cheap fertilizer. The costs had more than doubled, and so had all his other expenses. He also needed hot, dry weather for his harvest. Uh, what a lot of people don't realize is that we have a great deal of money tied up in the crop before we harvest a single acre or receive a single dollar. Probably got 40 to 45 dollars an acre tied up right now per acre. Charlie, could you keep Brett with you for and a while? And if we had a complete disaster, this money would be lost. We wouldn't have enough money to start farming, uh, put our seed in next year outside of pulling and borrowing more money, uh, hoping you have enough credit uh, left to get going. While he waited for the dry weather, Arley kept his equipment in order. Finally, it got warm and sunny and his crop was ready for harvest. must be brought in while the weather holds out. Any delay is costly. To harvest his entire crop will take early running several weeks without a break. At times into the night. His harvest will be adequate. Almost anywhere else in the world it would have been called a bumper crop. Anganu Parshad and his family waited for their crop too. He laboriously cut fodder for animal feed. By walking five hours, he could take it to Lucknow, 11 miles away, and bring back a very few rupees to help keep his family alive. Arley Running and his fabulous machines harvested a relative fortune. It was a good year for wheat, but it was a disastrous one for corn, which meant enough for the United States, but not enough to help everyone in the world who wanted American grain. The 
Throughout the rest of the world, there were serious crop failures. World grain production was down. India was one of the places destined to suffer. Anganur Parshad was one doomed to pain. If I could even give him enough wheat to sustain him for a year's time and however long it would be, there's no way, to be realistic, there's just no way that I could do it. Arlene and I, we can't uh, take it over ourselves. There's, there's, it's not economically feasible. And it, it just boils down to the, the government the system has to has to take care of this. Do we really owe these people something, or are we morally obligated to feed them? These questions aren't answered by us. They're made on political levels. Someone will have to decide who shall eat and who shall starve. It will not be either of these two men. You ever notice how things start to speed up this time of the year? It gets busier and busier until pretty soon holiday season is on us and everything happens at once. Traveling, shopping, entertaining. Well, that's time for Bank of America. And if you don't have one, well, maybe you ought to look into it. That's not going to solve all your problems, no way. But it sure can make things easier because when you've got a Bank of America, you've got a whole lot more than money. Shell's been producing oil from Cook Inlet for eight years now. Back in 1967, we began injecting water into this oil field. It costs more money, but thanks to the added push of the water, we're able to get more oil. At Shell, we're working hard to supply energy, and we know that you're doing your best to use it wisely. Shell, people working with energy. Hello, I'm Thornton Bradshaw, president of Atlantic Richfield Company. This is just one of the ideas sent to us about improving public transportation. We'll be sending out a certificate to everyone who submits an idea. And while we're pleased with the response so far, we're just not going to be happy till we've heard from everyone. So where's your idea on public transportation? Send your ideas to Ideas, Box 30169, Los Angeles 90030. Paul Moyer anchors the 6 p.m. news service starting tomorrow night. One thing which did happen here at the World Food Conference is that the problem of food in the world, of who eats and who doesn't, moved from the minds of the experts into the minds of a lot of ordinary people around the world. There was extensive press coverage in many countries and television programs like this one the outlines of this appallingly serious situation began to be shown as delegates grappled with what could be done to feed the world and what could not be done. From the American Secretary of State, the conference learned that the United States cannot by itself feed the world. The events of the past few years have brought home the great vulnerability of mankind to food emergencies caused by crop failures floods, wars, and other disasters. The world has come to depend on a few exporting countries, and particularly the United States, to maintain the necessary reserves. But reserves no longer exist. Dr. Kissinger knows that it isn't people who feed people, it is governments. He also knows that governments don't starve, but people do. Here, now, tough-minded but compassionate men have admitted that. The United States has a tragic answer to an important question. When asked, who shall feed this world, Americans must reply, we can't do it by ourselves. Americans have grown up with compassion, surrounded by abundance. It was known that shiploads of free surplus grain would always be available to hungry countries. That isn't true anymore. 
the United States, of course, doesn't have, are uh, the financial ability to feed the world without uh, compensation. It's ridiculous to say that the United States can stand out here and feed the world just because the world would like to be fed. Now, food is too scarce and too valuable, even in the United States, to be given away just for moral reasons. Food, like oil, is a necessity. Like oil, it is a political commodity. Food can buy things the nation needs, encourage the spirit of detente, and strengthen the dollar abroad. The American policy must always be trade, not aid. I think we have to work always toward the objective of getting nations on a trading basis and off the basis of being permanent recipients of aid. As a matter of fact, that's most of the way we do export our farm products. This year, Arley Runnings Wheat will be part of a $21 billion contribution to America's balance of payments. That's $21 billion of national income from the sale of food. We've developed a large export market, which is probably the, the greatest single factor that affects uh, the life of the farmer, the, the price he gets, uh, and the economic livelihood of the nation. The open market helps the farmer and the country, but it also creates problems. American consumers compete with other countries for Arley Runnings wheat. With world demand higher than world supply, and with our reserves dangerously low, the price of grain goes up and contributes to inflation at home. And not enough grain will go to fight hunger in India or around the world. The greatest danger of the open market system is the opportunity it gives affluent countries to purchase huge amounts of United States grain to use for their own political purposes. We're beginning to see uh, politics of food scarcity at the global level manifest itself in many ways. We saw the Soviets uh, two summers ago use secrecy to corner the world wheat market before uh, the world realized what had happened. To monitor grain sales of that kind, the administration now calls for advance approval of all large sales of grain for export. Well, obviously, we're concerned about any single purchaser coming in and dominating the market. Uh, this was demonstrated, I think, a few weeks ago when the Soviets came to this country and contracted for 3.2 million tons of wheat and corn. We had anticipated that they might be taking off from 1 million to 2 million tons. When this happened, we blew the whistle on it. We now require prior approval of any sale in excess of 50,000 tons. Incidentally, that 50,000 tons is only limited to one day but it may not exceed 100,000 tons in a week. Some say these measures are not strict enough. Washington opinion differs on this policy. Uh, I think that uh, we've got to have an open market approach, and that means that we've got to export uh, and import. That means that we've got to sell our products without putting limitations upon the amount that can go abroad. At a time when the reserves of our, when our supplies look like they're getting dangerously low, then the Secretary of Agriculture should be called upon to monitor every single export agreement and actually have export licensing so that we can keep a tab on and we can keep a, uh, a constant uh, uh, watchful eye over how much is going out of this country and how much is going to be left. <laughs> America controls more than one-third of the world's food. This enormous power, limited by voluntary controls, creates apprehension among all the other countries of the world and at home. The real test will come in the 70s and, and the 80s when our food prices are high at home, when we can sell our food elsewhere abroad to people who are paying money and foreign exchange we need, and yet there is hunger and starvation in places such as there was in the 60s in India. That's when the test will come. While 
While the harvest continued in North Dakota, Arlie Running worried about any new developments in Washington's food policy which might upset the wheat market. He had to decide how much grain to sell and how much to store. He had to gamble with no guarantee of a right decision. For Anganu Parshad, there were no decisions. He began his harvest in October. The monsoons were a problem, but he was able to salvage most of his weakened crop. And this year, as in most other years, there would not be enough to feed his family. No such occasion has ever occurred that the produce from my land has been sufficient for the consumption of my family. Every season I must buy about 400 pounds of extra grain so we can survive. Under Indian law, he is required to sell part of his harvest to the government to feed the millions of people in the cities. But Anganu Parshad couldn't. He was worried about his own survival. Besides constant overpopulation, hoarding, crop failure, and poor grain distribution added to the crisis. Not just in India, but in the other hungry countries of the developing world. As food grew scarce, peasants began flocking to the cities, where already there was not sufficient food. They found high prices, a flourishing black market, and the government distribution system broken down. If we reduce our food consumption in this country, it does not necessarily follow that hungry nations will get more food. We're transporting as much food abroad as there are facilities for transport and distribution. In the Sahel District of Africa, for example, we've put a half a million tons of grain in that area in the last two, in the last two years. We even supplied airplanes for air transport. The basic problem is the internal transportation and distribution systems. Though India is a country that ranks fourth in world grain production, its need for food is desperate. And India was faced finally, inevitably, with mass starvation. needed assistance, but they did not want to ask the United States publicly for help. Previous aid was humiliating to India. The Indians felt they had become too dependent on the United States. The Indians are, are properly determined to be self-reliant. They no more wish to be dependent on other people than, than we would. They hate it. India is a country where life and death have meanings difficult for Westerners to understand. It has a government which refuses to admit even a single death by starvation. It has a government which seems more interested in splitting the atom than restraining its exploding population and developing the means to feed it. I think that if uh, any of these uh, developing countries can afford to develop such a thing as an atomic bomb, that they certainly could uh, provide a whole lot of biscuits for their people at home. Mr. Turtle, Arlie Running's family knows that whenever the United States gives away billions of dollars worth of food, the price of food at home goes up. Experts predict that if the economy of the United States should collapse, the entire world is going to be in serious trouble and there will be no larder to supply the world. 
<laughs> Nevertheless, before Secretary Kissinger left India this October, he said the United States would make food available to India on a long-term concessional basis. The exact terms are still to be negotiated. Aid was offered for reasons of international politics as well as humanitarian reasons. We have given away in the last 20 years some $25 billion worth of American food primarily to relieve humanitarian needs around the world. On the other hand, food is also a diplomatic tool. I think American food is one of the strongest diplomatic tools that President Ford has or that Secretary of State Kissinger has right now. And we are learning how to use American food as a positive factor in building the edifice of peace. We get help to India because uh, uh, the Indian people need it. Uh, we get help because there's famine, or there, if not famine, there's malnutrition. If there is malnutrition, there is danger. Those hungry, deprived masses are not tolerant. Their demands for food have been forceful in the past and may well become violent in the future. In the future, in the very near future, there will be far too many hungry, unstable countries to be ignored. That would seem to be a good reason for Americans to care whether faraway people with far-out ideas get fed. Someday, people may remember the food crisis as the beginning of the food catastrophe. stove caught fire, she was covered by a fireman's fund homeowner's insurance. When Norman Funk's car was stolen, he was covered by fireman's fund auto insurance. When Macy O'Keeling was hurt at work, our workman's compensation covered him. In fact, this hat covers just about every business or personal need. And if it didn't, they wouldn't be laughing now. Fireman's Fund American, with agents in the yellow pages. First the shirt, then the jacket, even the overcoat. Half the work in bundling up is buttoning up. And when you sew, buttonholes are a lot of work. This Kenmore sewing machine from Sears has a snap-in buttonhole that sews buttonholes automatically. Sews on buttons, plus two stretch stitches. Now it's on sale for just $169. Save $20. Sewing for one or more is easy with this Kenmore. In the course of preparing this NBC News white paper, we asked a number of experts whether the United States has the responsibility to feed the world. The problem with a question like that is that it invites people to lie in their answers so readily. I've never known a subject about which there's more lying than this one. My very strong impression is that American people do not feel we have an obligation. Oh, I think we don't have any greater responsibility to use our wheat in, in food deficit nations than any other nation. I think other affluent nations of the world must now increasingly pick up a share of the humanitarian food needs of the world. There is a sense of compassion and humanitarianism in the American nation and in the Congress that represents the people. We are not going to have any policy that's based upon just let some folks starve if we can prevent it. If the American people sit and watch it, yeah. watch it on television, because that's a lot will happen, you know. And don't do anything about it. Well, we're going to have to face up that we're different people than we thought we were. Americans don't think they're the kind of people who can watch other people die and do nothing. At the same time, the hourly runnings and all Americans want to eat well and are most concerned, not with starvation elsewhere, but with the statistics of rising food prices at home.
In India, Anganu Parshad is concerned with terrible statistics. The statistics of hunger. In the year to come, there will be 13 million more Indian babies born to live the basic existence he lives. People who live like Anganu Parshad, most people in the developing world, are led to believe that the affluent countries are super rich, super fed. They think Americans should eat less and share more. Some Americans believe that too. But there are different views about that. I think most of us uh, would respond very positively to a request by uh, President Ford to reduce our consumption of uh, livestock products in order to uh, free up grain for shipment abroad. Well, I don't think the American people would be willing to uh, make uh, great sacrifices uh, in their own diets in order to distribute uh, food around the world. We can sit probably very smugly and, and say, gee, I sure feel sorry for those people over there. And we just finished a nice big steak or a, a beautiful meal. But as far as feeding the people, how can we do it and do it uh, without draining our country? Americans generally feel that they are entitled to their extravagant food. And Americans generally feel that poor countries should do something more dramatic about population control. But there are different views about that. I'm not sure India thinks it has a population problem. People see its population growing, 15 million a year. Every time a new moon goes up, there's another million people in India, more than that. And yet Indians like children. They don't see their growth as a threat. Individually, certainly they don't. You simply can't produce. You can't let every fish egg hatch and develop into a big fish because uh, it can crowd out the oceans. And you can't let every human being develop uh, because there wouldn't be place for them to stand on the earth. How do you expect us to control our population when the West is not controlling its consumption? Do you know that America consumes 35% of the world's resources? Look at all these boys. Sometime when they grow up, they're going to help their parents to earn a living. And nobody could be bothered about what is going to happen 20 years. Hence, the moment, this moment. The blame is exchanged, but the people are still hungry. 60 million Indians could be fed for one year if Americans reduced their meat consumption just 10%. That would take care of India. But there are many other countries in need. A reduction in worldwide overconsumption would help all developing countries in this crisis. The malnourished and hungry in the African Sahel, Indochina, and South America. And if there were some break on exploding populations, there would be no food crisis. There is no compromise in sight. In the absence of compromise, there must be an increase in food production. There's many things that, that uh, could be done to increase our, our production. But it all boils down to you have to pay for everything you do. And Unless we get paid for our product, you can't economically go out and get the last bushel per acre that this ground is capable of. The government must uh, have as a national policy a willingness to not only call upon the farmer to produce as a matter of national security and national need, but a willingness on the part of the government to share in that risk. But so far, there is no agreement on a policy to help American farmers produce more. And if there were greater production, there is no guarantee more American food would reach the poor countries. So the developing countries must produce more for themselves. That's where the greatest need exists. There's a saying that India is a underdeveloped country. It's not an underdeveloped country. It's simply a poor country. They can do anything here that can be done anywhere else in the world. 
It's a nuclear nation. It's a scientific nation. And its future is in its own hands. In many places, scientists and technicians are developing protein concentrates and high-yielding seeds and synthetic foods of enormous potential. They are searching the oceans for food and the skies for ways to handle the weather. They are working on irrigation and fertilization and enrichment of the land. But they are using up time as this crisis mounts. We have to face the fact that people are going to die of either starvation or malnutrition or of the diseases that take advantage of those suffering from malnutrition uh, every day. Uh, it may sound harsh to say that some will live and some will die, but this cannot be prevented. We cannot prevent it as a nation. The alternative is for political leaders to decide, in effect, to cast Asia adrift and let it go uh, and let nature take its course. The outlook is bleak indeed. Political unrest and even civil wars will be more likely as whole countries go hungry. And the United States is as vulnerable to the politics of scarcity as other countries. We are as dependent on their resources as they are dependent on our food. Our running depends upon imported oil and copper for his machines. Anganu Parshad needs imported seeds and oil for fertilizer. Both are victims of the scarcities of these resources. As farmers, they produce food for the world, but they can't produce for everyone in it. They can never produce more without cooperation among the world's governments. If those governments fail, the result would be chaos engulfing them, engulfing us all. It's quiet now in the Palazzo del Congresso. The delegates have left Rome and gone home. Most of them as disunited as when they arrived. They raised many questions here, but left without agreement on the answers. Many delegates went home to hungry and malnourished countries. At the beginning of this program, we suggested that we would try to answer some questions. Why are people dying of hunger? Well, for one thing, there are just too many of them. For another thing, all the rest of us must share some blame, because it's our governments who decide who shall eat in the world, who cares what is happening to starving people and the world they leave behind them? Apparently, very few care. And who shall feed this world? At this moment, there's no answer. One possibility is a true world food system. And the hungry countries, of course, must learn to feed themselves, though the odds of that happening in time are slender. But if the world is not fed, it will be a different, more dangerous world, and soon. Let's conclude with one fact. In the hour of this program, 13,000 more people have been born. Half of them are dying now because they don't have enough to eat. 